I rise to oppose the First Nations Voice Bill 2023. I have made clear publicly and will reiterate here in this chamber that no amount of detail will make a race-based uh, legislation a positive step for Australian society. And to segregate us by race uh, is an enormous backward step for Australia. The Attorney General and I have, in fact, nothing in common when it comes to our opinion on this First Nations Voice Bill. But, in fact, on the topic of lifting up those most disadvantaged, we have much in common. And I find the suggestion that opposing this bill and a no campaign is akin to bigotry and hatefulness, as stated in the Attorney's second reading speech, deeply offensive. I have made clear publicly, Mr President, and will reiterate in this chamber that for me and the constituents I represent, the way forward to assist those of us who are most vulnerable and disadvantaged, which is a fundamental passion of mine, is to focus on need, regardless of race. This approach would obviously include support and lift up the unacceptable fact that a disproportionate number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live in despairing conditions, whilst not ignoring the fact that almost three quarters of those living in poverty and either homeless or at imminent risk of being homeless are in fact not Indigenous. This proposition of a First Nations voice bill also in no way acknowledges the fact that many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are doing as well as non-Indigenous Australians. They get educated, work and contribute positively. I believe, Mr President, in respecting people's culture and people's right to maintain a culture where it is cohesive and not in conflict of the values of Australian society. That is different, different Mr President, to supporting race-based legislation that divides us. And again, I reiterate how insulting I find the suggestion that concerns or opposition to this government's approach to enhancing the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is in conflict to wanting to enhance the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. This couldn't be further from the truth, and I stand with those in the community who want to see funds spent on real, tangible benefits for the Aboriginal community, not bureaucracy, and those who feel strongly that we should all be seen as fundamentally equal under the law. I know many faith groups and people living in both rural and city communities oppose this piece of legislation. South Australians deserve, Mr President, from their elected South Australian Labor government a balanced and rational approach, and I must express my disappointment that the attorney failed to mention the many myriad of strategies taken to try and enhance the lives of Aboriginal people by progressive governments in his recent address to Parliament. The attorney did not mention the over $30 billion a year spent on trying to bridge the gap or that at a minimum twice as much money is spent on, by the government on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or, in fact, the many thousands of Aboriginal groups that have been established and supported by the government. But with many measures actually getting worse, such as suicide rates, adult incarceration rates, number of children school ready and number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children living in out-of-home care, many ask where is all the money going and why is it not working? Speaking to people in the Aboriginal community recently, they assure me they don't see it and I believe them. An investigation into all this spending with no outcome and increased transparency are urgently needed, not, in fact, another web of complicated bureaucracy as proposed here by the South Australian Labor government, masked by the name The Voice. The attorney's second reading speech seemed only designed to shame and guilt non-Indigenous Australians, which, might I add, one in four Australians are immigrants or refugees who have since established themselves in this fabulous country after colonisation, contributing, thriving, many of whom came from their own impoverished conditions in their home country with their own stories of disadvantage and hardship. And we in this chamber must, must remember what a fabulous country Australia is, and many are given the opportunity to thrive and succeed despite an unfair start. Let me make clear, however, more can and should be done for those who are impoverished in this state but on a needs, not a race, basis. As I stated, I am against the concept of the bill, but I will point out some specific concerns of the bill. Section 4, subsection 1, meaning of First Nations person states that a person will be taken to be a First Nations person if they a, are of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent, or b regard, b, regard themselves as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, and c, are accepted as an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person by the relevant Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander community. How will it be determined, as stated in section 4, subsection 1a, that an individual is Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? 
Section 4, subsection 2 states that for the purposes of this Act, a person will be taken to be of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent if they are biologically descended from the persons who inhabited Australia or Torres Strait Islands before European settlement. But how would this be determined? And is all this scrutiny on someone's race a positive thing? For me, it's such a backward step. And a focus on need rather than race would avoid such inappropriate speculation. It is explicitly stated in the Commissioner for First Nations Voice to the South Australian Parliament's second engagement report that under the current model there is no requirement for voters to submit proof of Aboriginality documentation as part of their declaration. The government is aware of the potential pitfall of proving Aboriginality, suggesting within the second engagement report that an Aboriginal commissioner may indeed be established in future to verify connection to country. How much is this all going to cost going forward? Is this a positive step? I would say no, as many in our community. As stated earlier for me and the constituents I represent, the way forward is needs-based, not race-based support. And it's felt as though we must not question how much the voice will cost. We must not oppose a bill that is based on race or will face being called bigoted and hateful. Ironically, many Aboriginals are questioning the voice bill and whether it will actually result in change for them, whether they will in fact have their voices bypassed as a result of the establishment of the voice and ask why money, time and energy being directed towards the debate and enactment of the voice can't not just be directly applied to tangible out outcomes on the myriad of issues already expressed and ignored by the government. More concerning is the lack of detail in some fairly significant areas, such as the actual number of regions, the number of elected members in the local First Nations voice, the number of members comprising the state, na na state First Nations voice. Despite numbers being publicly stated, no actual numbers are stipulated in the bill. Most concerning is segment 34, other advisory committees. The state First Nations voice may essentially establish any number of other such committees with the Attorney General's approval, and members of those committees will be legislatively entitled to such remuneration, allowances and expenses as determined by the Minister. This reads as a potential blank cheque paid for by every South Australian taxpayer. I wonder where is the child and young person's visitor, visitors guaranteed resourcing? I submitted legislation last year that would have secured adequate resourcing to the team who look after the well-being of children and young people living in state residential care. We know there is an over-representation of Aboriginal children in our child protection system, but the Labor government voted no. This is another example of the Malinowskis government funding bureaucracy and not real tangible solutions. I'd like to speak to the amendment to the First Nations Voice Bill I intend to move regarding Section 34 other advisory committees. This amendment is designed to ensure that the establishment of further committees is only undertaken where it can be shown that expertise cannot be sourced by the already First Nations voice. I make clear that I oppose the bill entirely, but considering it is clear there are the numbers for it to pass, I want to ensure I give Parliament the opportunity to ensure appropriate restraint on the establishment of further committees. Section 41 of the First Nations Voice Bill notes clearly that the state First Nations Voice may provide a report to Parliament, but legislatively they do not have to provide a report or attend. Where is the accountability? Section 42 repeats this. It may be requested to present to Parliament, but they have a get-out clause in Section 42, subsection 3. However, nothing in this section requires the state First Nations Voice or a member of the state First Nations Voice to provide a report or attend Parliament. Parliamentary committees must report due diligence and best practice to show accountability to the South Australian taxpayer. Mr President, race-based legislation has no place in our society and does nothing to promote cohesion and unity. Assistance in addressing those who are living in disparaging circumstances should be delivered on need, not any divisive mechanism like this legislation sets out to enshrine in our laws. I'll be voting no and I'll be representing many South Australians whom the Malinowskis government has chosen to ignore in the pursuit of rushing this legislation through, frankly, to stroke their own ego ahead of a federal referendum.